Welcome to another uh, webinar of Fentanova Medical. My name is Jose van der Hoorn, I'm the clinical director, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, doctors uh, Jo Marissa and Marieke Kuut uh, from the Rob Robboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Uh, uh, both um, of you are anesthesiologists, uh, specialized um, in the cardiac and lung surgery. Uh, you work for quite some time already with, uh, with Yvonne and Tritoop, uh, and being the, the reference hospital of the Netherlands for trachea sections, you obtain a lot of experience in these procedures specifically, and we are so pleased, to, so happy that you will share uh, your experience today. Um, the presentation will take approximately 30 minutes, uh, so all attendants are, uh, are invited to ask their questions via the chat function, which is visible if you exit the full screen mode, then you can ask your questions in the chat function. And I will ask them after the presentation uh, to Jo Marissa and uh, Marieke Kuut. Um, so, um, your uh, presentation's title is Ventilation through, th uh, through Tritube for Tracheal Resections, a new ventilation technology. Um, well, please start the presentation. This webinar is about our experience in the use of an ultra-thin ventilation tube, the Tritube, during segmental tracheal resections. We thank uh, Fentinova for the invitation for this webinar. Neither Marike or me has any disclosure. In this presentation, we will first discuss the conventional approach and some alternative approaches. Then we shall introduce you shortly in the use of tight tube and the Yvonne ventilation. And next we will present some cases. We show also some data from our observational study. The most frequent cause of tracheal stenosis is after a traumatic intubation or a hyperinflated cuff of an endotracheal tube. It is also frequently seen after tracheostoma. A large amount of our patients presents with the cancer of the trachea and other causes are listed on the slide. Symptoms of dyspnea begin when the trachea is obstructed for more than 50% and symptoms of strider can only become obvious when the stenosis is less than 6 mm. Initial therapy is rigid bronchoscopy and dilatation of the stenosis or laser evaporation of the lesion. Frequently there is a recurrence of the stenosis and then segmental tracheal resection can be an option. Depending on the site of the stenosis, the surgery can be performed with a cervical incision, a partial stenotomy or a complete stenotomy. For the lower parts, a right-sided thoracotomy is needed. For the stenosis in the upper part, a tube mostly bigger than the stenosis will be forced through the stenosis. For the lower part, the tube will be left above the stenosis. Anesthesia for tracheal resections is a challenge. A tube is forced through the stenosis, and such an intubation is traumatic and can lead to bleeding or fragmentation of the tumor. To minimize trauma, a small tube is used. When ventilating through small tubes or through a narrow stenosis, there will be a high airway resistance and an increased pressure and there is a risk of air trapping and inadequate ventilation. During surgery, after the trachea is cut through, the distal trachea or the bronchus had to be intubated with the second tube across the surgical field, the so-called cross-field intubation. The suture must be completed in multiple periods of apnea that will be tolerated differently from patient to patient and periods of desaturation leads to possible stressful situations for surgeon and anesthesiologist. Finally, the oral tube must be advanced again in its original position. At the end of the surgery, patients are ideally extubated. This period is also risky. If the upper part of the trachea and the cricoid is resected, 
there is a chance of clotic edema with the risk of asphyxia. There is also a possibility that the recurrent laryngeal nerves are injured with focal cord paralysis is as a consequence. If bilateral, the focal cords remain closed. Patient's head had to be flexed to prevent traction on the tracheal anastomosis and therefore a chin suture is placed. This is a position that is far from favor favorable for a free airway. There are some alternatives for tracheal resection like uh, jet ventilation, high oxygen flow devices like OptiFlow. These are more used during throat surgery. Spontaneous ventilation and tubeless surgery is reported and also ECMO and card cardiopulmonary bypass are used. In a systematic review of publications, almost 800 cases were analyzed. In the majority of these cases, Crossfield intubation was used. In the last 10 years, the use of ECMO is increasingly reported. There were about 25 reported cases. This is a simple overview of advantages and disadvantages of the alternative methods. The surgical view is poor in cross-field intubation, good for jet ventilation and ideal for spontaneous tubeless ventilation and ECMO. Disadvantage for jet ventilation is the risk of barotrauma, mucosal injury and the spread of aerosols. In the present COVID times, we are very cautious with that. Surgery during spontaneous ventilation is difficult because movements and coughing. There is also an increased risk of aspiration. For ECMO, there is a risk for vascular injury and coagulopathy. But since a few years we have an alternative and Marike takes it over from now. Uh, many problems during tracheal resections can be solved uh, if you were able to use a, a very small tube. Um, so tritube is a very small tube. As you can see, the outer diameter is only 4.4 millimeters. Uh, it is designed to be used with a specialist, specialized ventilation machine, um, uh, where we tell you later on a, a little bit about. Um, as you can see, Tritube has three uh, lumen. One is for uh, tracheal pressure measurement, uh, one is for ventilation, and then, of course, there's also a cuff lumen. The question is, how can you ventilate an adult person through such a small channel? Uh, you need a, a special uh, ventilator for that. Um, I'll show you one. Here you see the Evona ventilator. There is a constant flow that can be set, an I to E ratio, expiratory and expiratory pressure and peak pressure and of course also the inspired fraction of oxygen. Tracheal pressure is me measured through a third lumen of the tritube. Um, inspiration will last until the set peak pressure is reached and then the machine switches automatically to expiration with active suction until end expiratory pressure is reached. Uh, the Venturi mechanism creates a negative pressure at the ventilator side, but at the tracheal side the pressure is positive if EEP is set positive. When EEP is reached, next inspiration is started. There are no ventilatory pauses. Uh, the tidal volume and carbon dioxide pressure is measured using mainstream capnography. Humidification of the inspired gases is done by using a pediatric ventilation filter. Uh, apart from flow control ventilation, the machine has also a jet ventilation mode. Um, as you can see, uh, the use of this machine is totally different from a normal anesthesia ventilator. Uh, minute volume is mainly determined by flow rate. Uh, in regular use, IE ratio is set 1 to 1, uh, and minute volume is then half of the set flow. Um, the settings uh, doesn't involve respiratory rate, uh, but respiratory rate um, uh, depends on the set pressures and flow rate and, of course, lung compliance. Um, 
Uh, this slide tells a little bit more about flow-controlled ventilation. Uh, on the right side you see three pressure curves uh, using flow-controlled ventilation, uh, pressure and volume-controlled ventilation. Uh, you can see uh, there are a couple of big differences. Uh, when expiration begins with volume and pressure controlled ventilation, uh, there is a huge drop in pressure resulting in high flow. Um, with flow controlled ventilation, this drop in pressure is linear as flow is constant. Uh, because of the narrow bore tubes, both inspiration and expiration is slow, creating a smooth and gentle way of ventilation. Typically, the IE ratio is set one to one. Uh, it is assumed that the lung contains compartments with different time constants. Uh, ventilating with a low flow allows also the slow compartments to be ventilated and thus the lungs will be more open. So now we would like to focus on the experiences with Trichup. On this slide you see what has been published about the use of Trichup during airway surgery. Uh, Johanna Schmidt reported on 15 patients undergoing laryngeal surgery. Uh, one patient uh, was excluded because the patient coughed out trichup. Uh, there was good surgical view and the patients could all be normally ventilated. Um, tube dislocation happens uh, in other cases as well uh, due to different reasons. Uh, Jeroen Meulemans from Leuven in Belgium reported 15 cases of successful use of Trichup and Ivona in upper airway surgery. He also presented a very interesting webinar for Ventinova, uh, more focusing more on the surgeon's uh, point of view. Jo, Maurice and myself work in the Radboud University Medical Center. We do around 20 tracheal resections every year. Uh, we started using Trichup for tracheal resections in March uh, 2019. And from the middle of 2019, we started to register data in a small observational trial. Uh, for now, Trichup and Ivona ventilation is our standard of care for during tracheal resections. And we also use it for some selected uh, ENT cases. Uh, we would like to share with you in more detail the fourth case of tracheal surgery uh, where we used Trichup. Uh, partially successful, uh, but it is a case that told us a lot about uh, the use of Trichup during these types of surgery. Uh, the case was a 60 year old man. Um, he probably got post-intubation tracheal stenosis following multiple eye surgeries he had in the past. Uh, he was treated uh, by laser um, and he had a stenosis uh, only five millimeter lumen. We had a very standard plan performing anesthesia. Uh, we used an arterial line um, we used propofol, remifentanil and rocuronium. Uh, we placed Trichup with classic uh, laryngoscopy and we started ventilating using Ivona. And we used a bronchoscope to evaluate the position of Trichup in the trachea. The surgical plan in this case was to resect the coricoid cartilage and four tracheal rings. Incision was at the trachea um, at the distal end of the stenosis, as you can see in the picture on the right side. Uh, during this incision, Trichup's cuff was punctured. Um, then uh, the Ivona ventilator uh, notices that uh, uh, there was uh, air loss, so it changed to jet ventilation. Uh, we decided to uh, exchange Trichup uh, using a CVL guide wire uh, and after that we could resume 
uh, flow controlled ventilation um, and the surgeon could position uh, three tubes cuff uh, a little bit more distal. Uh, this video is made uh, during surgery where you can see uh, the surgeon can easily work around three tube. Um, uh, he moves it from the left to the right and uh, can easily work around it uh, while the patient is still uh, being ventilated. Uh, during this case, uh, there were a couple of problems. Uh, one uh, problem was that um, Tritube's uh, position was a little bit unstable. Uh, it kept on moving upwards uh, and then the cuff uh, moved into the surgical field. Uh, that was very difficult for the surgeon, so he kept on pushing it uh, a little bit back. Uh, the other problem was um, due to the cricoid resection that was very high, uh, there was collapse of subglottic structures um, and the surgeon asked uh, for some support uh, there. So the small size of tree tube was actually uh, a disadvantage uh, for the surgeon in this specific case. Um, so we decided to, decided to remove uh, tree tube and for ventilation of the patient we used uh, Crossfield intubation with a uh, conventional endotracheal tube. Uh, you can see that uh, in the picture on the right side. And then to support the uh, subglottic uh, structures, we uh, place a second endotracheal tube uh, between the focal cords uh, for support there. So after the posterior part of the anastomosis was finished, um, the surgeon didn't really need the endotracheal tube for support anymore, so we performed another tube exchange. Uh, so the surgeon moved up a retro retrograde a guide wire um, and it uh, came out the nasal roots. So then uh, we decided also to place uh, the next tree tube uh, via the nasal root, um, and that um, gave us a more stable position actually. Um, so then we uh, resumed flow controlled uh, ventilation and the surgeon uh, could finish the anterior part of the sutures. When the trachea is closed, we always perform a leak test. So we close um, the nose and the mouth of the patient and we empty the cuff uh, and we uh, give some pressure and then the surgeon uh, has a look uh, if there's uh, air bubbles in the um, surgical field. Uh, after that uh, we perform a bronchoscopic ev evaluation um, to check uh, if there's any swelling or uh, glottic edema um, and we check of course um, if the anastomosis uh, looks uh, good. Um, and then we can also uh, remove any blood or sputum that's um, uh, in the trachea. Uh, and we then decide if we're going to extubate the patient or if we're going to bring it to the intensive care uh, with the tube still in situ and then do an extubation attempt maybe one or two days after surgery. In this uh, specific case, uh, we saw that there was actually some edema, but we saw there was also enough space to try and remove the endotracheal tube. We thought that was a safe option. So, um, since there is no a possibility to have spontaneous ventilation with the cuff um, still inflated. Um, at the first moment that the patient starts moving or opens, opens his eyes, we of course empty the cuff um, and then we start uh, jet ventilation. Um, this patient could breathe very comfortably uh, with tritube in place uh, with a deflated cuff. Uh, 
um, and that resulted in a free airway without uh, any stridor. Uh, since this patient could breathe quite comfortable with three tubes still in its place, we decided to uh, transfer him to the intensive care unit with three tubes still in place. Uh, of course, uh, swelling can increase uh, the first hours uh, or even day after surgery. Um, so we left it in place for two hours uh, and then we removed it. Uh, the patient already noticed that even with three tubes still in situ, he had more, uh, more air, actually. Uh, this case we just presented to you was actually the start of a small observational study that we performed uh, on the use of three tube uh, during tracheal surgery. Um, we included uh, all the patients that presented for cricotracheal and segmental tracheal resections and uh, we recorded data on ventilation and hemodynamics um, but also data on tube and ventilation related uh, events. Um, of course, we found that three tube uh, was much easier uh, to use uh, than um, the microlaryngeal tubes that we used before uh, for passage of the stenosis uh, because of the much smaller size, of course. Um, you can also choose to use uh, three tube through an endotracheal or through uh, a laryngeal uh, airway. Um, the use of uh, three tube resulted in uh, excellent ventilation uh, parameters, um, and we uh, found uh, that we could more easily use bronchoscopy um, with during uh, and after uh, uh, surgery and placement of three tube. Um, because you can use the bronchoscope uh, next to the tube uh, and not via the tube, uh, which uh, we did uh, before. Um, we could not include all uh, patients uh, presenting for segmental trachea resections, um, especially in uh, the more distal tracheal uh, pathology gave us uh, difficulty using three tube. Um, but we, my colleague Jo Maurice uh, will tell you more about that. Uh, but out of 10 patients, we could use three tube successfully in eight patients. Uh, in most of our cases, it was possible for the surgeon to work around three tube without the need for uh, tube exchange. Um, in seven out of eight cases, it was possible to complete the tracheal anastomosis with three tube uh, in situ, and we think that's a very good uh, result. Uh, and uh, also, the surgeons uh, were very happy uh, with that um, because there was no need for cross field intubation. Uh, of course, uh, we also had some uh, troubleshooting uh, as we presented um, in the case as well. Uh, we found out that um, nasal placement uh, resulted in a more stable position uh, of three tube. Um, of course, with tracheal incision, there's always a danger that um, it will result uh, in cuff leak. Uh, uh, you can try and prevent it by emptying the cuff before tracheal incision, uh, but it's not always uh, in total uh, preventable. Um, um, we also saw some obstruction uh, due to kinking of the tube, um, but um, nasal placement um, uh, reduced that as well. Uh, during our study, we had two patients presenting for more distal segmental tracheal resection. Um, and in those patients, it was not possible um, to use three tube. Uh, but my colleague, uh, Jo Maurice, will tell you more about that. Uh, we think that uh, three tube adds more safety. Uh, to extubation procedures after tracheal resection uh, because of the better possibility to perform uh, bronchoscopy with the tube still in place. Uh, 
Um, you can use the tube for oxygen insufflation as well, or a jet modus. Uh, you can use it as a suction catheter while extubation. And uh, you, you have a better view uh, to decide uh, if you actually uh, are going to perform an extubation or if you're going to leave the tube in place. Um, of course, uh, the small lumen of Tritube also has disadvantages. Uh, one of those uh, you can see uh, on the video on the right side. Um, sometimes people with tracheal stenosis have uh, a lot of secretions. Uh, and in this video you can see um, secretions moving up and down uh, Tritube. Uh, in some cases, uh, secretions do cause obstruction and you need to suction or purge tree tube uh, to make sure you can still uh, ventilate your patient. As Marike said, we had two cases where the use of tri tube was not possible. In both cases, the lesion was distal in the trachea. When the tri tube was placed behind the lesion, it was not possible to ventilate the lungs because of obstruction. The tip of the tri tube was on the carina or on the wall of one of the main bronchi. For future cases, we thought that you're reducing the length of the cuff and or reducing the length of the tip, maybe ventilation will be possible. With such a modification, it could be possible to put the tritube in the left main bronchus and apply one lung ventilation. This could be an elegant solution for right-sided thoracotomy if needed for distal tracheal resections. Until now we have done five cases with an adapted tritube where three of them required a thoracotomy and one lung ventilation. This is what we did. We reduced the length and the size of the cuff with surgical knots. In some cases we also cut the tip. In this way we reduced the length from 6.5 cm to 3 cm. A normal left main bronchus measures 4 to 4.5 cm, this, this will fit. After cutting the tip the edges are smoothed and the internal channel for the filling of the cuff has to be occluded with glue. This must be done at least one hour before application to let the glue to dry and harden. Now I let you see two case reports with adapted tri tube. In this case, a 68 years old man presents with dyspnea and on CT scan, a three centimeter large mass is seen two centimeters above the carina. First a debulking by rigid bronchoscopy takes place and the tumor is diagnosed as an adeno adenoid kystic adenoma. To completely remove the tumor a partial trachea resection is needed and the access will be via a sternotomy. First we put a tube number 9 in and we shorten this one to 25 centimeters. Then a tritube with a reduced cuff is inserted. This is the video of the placement of the tritube. First it is at the proximal end of the tube and then the lesion in the distal trachea is passed and then it is positioned before the right main stem bronchus. But we want it to go to the left main bronchus. We have to manipulate the tube and push the throat up exteriorly to the right and then the tritube slides into the left main bronchus. After anastomosis is done, there is a good bronchoscopic view of the sutures. The next case was a big challenge. A 49 years old man with a history of partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, where he was operated for, presents with dyspnea at exercise. On a CT scan there is a tracheal bronchus and a narrow distal trachea of only 11 millimeters. 
The surgical plan was to perform a sliding tracheoplasty via a right thoracotomy. The anesthesia plan has some difficulty, as you can guess. First, I show you the surgical technique. After a transection of the trachea, a longitudinal incision is performed in the distal trachea and the right or left main bronchus. Then the distal part is pulled upwards and anastomosed so that it becomes wider and shorter. What are the options for anesthesia? We needed one lung ventilation. The lumen tube is too big to pass the narrow parts. If a bronchus blocker is the choice, you will need two of them, one for the tracheal bronchus and one for the right main bronchus. In both cases you will need cross-field intubation, but then the surgical view will be too poor to perform the operation. And then the venovenous ECMO has to be performed. But we used an adapted tritube and avoided the use of ECMO. We intubated first the patient with the tube number 9 and shortened it to 24 cm. Because of a known difficult intubation, we used a McGrath video laryngoscope. Then we put an adapted tritube together with the bronchoscope into the endotracheal tube. In this case, the cuff was reduced and the tip shortened. It was not easy to put the tip in the final destination, the left main bronchus. We had to use the wire of an arm blocker, which was put inside the tritube and guide the tritube with the bronchoscope toward the left main bronchus. Here we see the video of that operation. First we see the thoracotomy, and then we see a view from inside the thorax. The distal trochea and the left and right main bronchus is identified. And then the trochea is cut through. And next there is a longitudinal transection from the trochea to the left main bronchus. The right tube cuff becomes visible. Ventilation is going on, there's no problem. Almost comes out, uh, certainly, it's a certain moment. And then the reconstruction is performed with ongoing ventilation of the left lung. No ECMO was needed. So in this last slide, you can see our conclusions regarding the use of tritube for tracheal resections. One of the advantages is that it's much easier to pass the stenosis during intubation uh, and bronchoscopy has much more possibilities with tritube. Um, of course, there is a reduced need for periods of apnea and there are less tube manipulations and re-intubations uh, during surgery. The airway is protected for a longer period. Uh, of course, we saw some obstructions, but in all cases, they were solvable. And we think uh, the nasal route uh, results in a more stable position uh, of uh, tree tube. Uh, we would like to use tree tube as well for one lung ventilation in cases a thoracotomy is necessary to perform a more distal tracheal surgery. Um, we think tritube also adds safety uh, 
to the period of extubation because you can sometimes leave it in place um, with a spontaneous uh, ventilating uh, patient. Our surgeons also think Tritube has uh, advantages. Um, the most important one is they can work around it uh, and there's better uh, visibility in the surgical field. Um, uh, in times of COVID, no aerosol spread uh, also might be an important advantage. Um, and it, of course, reduces the need for cross-field intubation and periods of apnea. So a modification of the tritube to better fit the distal trachea uh, or the left to right uh, main bronchus would be very helpful for our practice. So we can also perform more distal surgery uh, with the use of tritube. Uh, thank you all for your uh, attention. And, uh, we would like to see if there's uh, some questions we can answer. Yes, well, thank you for the uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I apologize, there were some viewers that had difficulties with uh, uh, getting the right uh, sound and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and that did get a black screen, but I think the, this webinar is recorded and it will be made available via our website. So please, uh, we, we, will, we will make sure it, it, you can reach it and you can see it. Um, uh, this last uh, slide. Um, I think I, I would like to comment on that, on this modified tritube. I think you have it on your table right there. Um, uh, we think it's really interesting, this, this, new, tri uh, tri uh, the, this new modification. Of course, we consider this uh, off-label use, um, but uh, we are definitely looking into that and we're investigating this, uh, this option. Um, so uh, maybe in the future we, uh, <laughs> we can provide something like that. Um, I think we have some quite some questions via, via the, the chat function. Uh, so a first question was, uh, when you leave tritube in place uh, while putting the patient uh, in the ICU, do you need to use muscle relaxants for that? Oh, um, no, of course not. Um, the patient is breathing spontaneously then. So uh, the patient is fully away and has full motor function, of course. So then the, um, the, the cuff is deflated, you leave the, the, the tube in place, but does it also uh, result in a cuffing response of the patient? And is, do you want to prevent that or don't you need to do it? Well, the cuffing is uh, not a good idea when the trachea is uh, <laughs> had a weak anastomosis at that time. So it's better <clears throat> not to let the patient cuff. If that happens, you have to... Uh, retract the tritube. But in general, we, uh, our experience is that uh, the tritube is well accepted. There is, uh, we have not done in this, until this time 20 to 25 uh, cases. And maybe there, there were two or, or three patients that we had to remove the tritube immediately. Other patients accepted it very well. Okay, and then you can leave it in place for, for an hour or so? Uh, uh, or yes. But it depends uh, on um, uh, what the pathology is. is the, if there is a resection in the upper part of the trachea and uh, the craquid, then there is a chance of uh, edema. If the resection is in the middle of the lower part, there is no uh, chance of edema at the upper airway. So then you will, will not uh, let the, the tritube in place. Ah, okay, and, and do you also consider this for uh, other laryngeal surgery or so to, to do this? Or don't you consider that as high risk? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, of course, yes. Cool. And uh, you also mentioned, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kut mentioned uh, the first publications on trito by Johanna Schmidt, uh, that there was a tube dislocation reported. Uh, could you maybe comment on that? And did you also experience uh, uh, that? Uh, no, uh, we didn't experience that, but I can imagine that happening because um, the tritube is so very narrow. If the patient makes an attempt to breathe spontaneously, there's much more pressure behind the cuff 
then with uh, regular uh, tubes where the patient can also breathe uh, spontaneously with an inflated cuff. Uh, so uh, at really at the first sign uh, that the patient will attempt, uh, attempt to breathe, you have to deflate uh, uh, the cuff. Um, and yeah, if the patient coughs only a little bit, then uh, um, you can expect uh, the tube to be cuffed out, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so you need to just be there and watch the patient, and when uh, he or she is awake, just deflate yeah. the cuff. Um. Also, uh, I think also um, when tritube is um, placed via the oral route, it's uh, a little bit more difficult to uh, have a good fixation because uh, you have a, um, it's more banded. And it has more uh, uh, room to to move uh, in the mouth of the patient, uh, and via the, the, nas the, the, the nasal route, it's more uh, in line, and you can uh, take it uh, in its place better. Yeah. So then you can, be, you can also put it uh, through an endotracheal tube, a big endotracheal tube. Then it will also be better fixed, or via a laryngeal, laryngeal mask uh, airway. It's also uh, a good thing to do. Yeah, so that, that will be an extra fixation point for the tube, um, and, and, and yes. pre prevent a potential dislocation or the risk on dislocation. For the nasal intubation, uh, how do you do it? Do you use a guide wire, or, um, or how is it, or is it easily done without? <laughs> Uh, yes, it's it's easily done uh, without. Um, you can uh, use a, um, a McCoy to position it, like just like a normal how you would perform a normal nasal uh, intubation. And um, you also showed uh, some uh, secretions may block uh, the small lumen of the tritube. And you mentioned that you used the suctioning to prevent it. Also, uh, prior to intubation, and also during intubation, uh, during ventilation, you may use the suctioning. Uh, do you also use uh, drugs like glycoperonium or so to to prevent this? Well, we thought about it to use uh, atropine or glycoperonium, but uh, we consulted our uh, pulmonologist, and he said that it's uh, uh, use useless to do that. Uh, he doesn't see any advantage, and he is a uh, the, the man who always uh, does the bronchoscopy, uh, he, he can know it. Yeah. And uh, so we, we do not uh, use uh, glycoperonium or atropine in our patients. And well, maybe we have uh, lots of uh, secretions in a few patients, but we, yeah, it's, we can handle it. And it, uh, yeah, I, I think that other centers have the, 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 the same frequency of uh, uh, secretions as, as we are. Okay, but just and some some uh, uh, tra uh, patients with tracheal stenosis have a little bit of buildup of secretions behind uh, their uh, stenosis that comes uh, uh, with the disease, uh, but uh, only uh, some, not not all of them. Okay, so but an, um, another question is on uh, the jet function. Uh, you mentioned that once uh, you damaged uh, uh, the cuff of tritube and then you could switch to the jet ventilation. Was it easy to do or was it uh, uh, difficult? And uh, were there any periods of, of desaturation or was there any risk? Uh, no, that's actually very easy, uh, easy to do. Uh, we sometimes also use that during a placement. Uh, if you want to position uh, a tritube um, behind the stenosis, then you can uh, uh, use bronchoscopy uh, and uh, the jet ventilation modus um, until you're sure uh, it has passed uh, the stenosis and you can safely inflate uh, the cuff. Okay. So the switch is very easy. Oh, that, that's good to know. Um, Actually, he is going automatically uh, when you empty the cuff yeah. or the, the, the sputter. He is uh, automatically he goes to a low frequency jet ventilation. That is uh, very helpful to overcome the, the period of uh, apnea and uh, eventually desaturation. So it's very elegantly that, that uh, this way it goes. Yeah, and it's uh, the, the the machine uh, uh, provides some uh, purchase of gas uh, when the cuff is deflated already. So you say that's already enough to uh, to keep the, the patient uh, well saturated. Yes. 
Um, and as a qu another question, do uh, can you estimate if there is what's the effect on the duration of surgery using tritube instead of the uh, the other in front of, uh, uh, of in situ uh, intubations? Well, the ventilation uh, is uh, at least equal to uh, what we uh, are used with um, uh, a normal tubes, if possible. Uh, but the problem exists when you have to use a very small tube and uh, use a conventional ventilator, then uh, you, you can have uh, problems with, with too, too high pressures and uh, um, problems like uh, uh, air uh, trapping, etc. And uh, eventually bad uh, blood gases as a result then, and uh, blood pressure of uh, circulation problems. Yeah. So we are, um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter how narrow the stenosis is or how narrow the tube is, we can ventilate in a very normal uh, manner. This is normally not possible. And um, the, the surgeons, how are they experiencing this? Uh, how did they take this, this new technology? Was it especially... Uh, uh, they asked for it, so that can't be better than, than, than that. It's now our uh, uh, preferred method to, to use it, and uh, um, in the two years we use it, uh, uh, more and more anesthesiologists are, uh, are used to, to work with it, but uh, not all of them, of course. I think that uh, we have now 5% of our anesthesiologists can work with it, and, uh, but that must be increased. Uh, also for our uh, EMT, uh, uh, Doctors also uh, like to use it more and more, so it, uh, it's popular. Is, is it a, a steep learning curve for your anesthesiologist to get, get uh, used to work with the device? Or does it take time, or is it an intense, <laughs> intense uh, training method? Well, <coughs> it, it's, it's not very uh, difficult. After you've done one case uh, with an experienced uh, doctor, and then uh, you can uh, do it yourself. There, there are a lot of uh, tips and tricks to, to, to do, but that can be learned uh, very quickly. You must not start it on, on your own with a manual uh, site. That, that is not a good idea. No, no I, I totally agree on that. So just uh, and uh, the, the uh, Fentinova also uh, advises to use uh, the device for the first time in a quite easy uh, case uh, with not too many difficulties, and then it should be easy to learn. Uh, I have a question uh, here. What's your idea on how much ECMO usage you could prevent using Avone and Tritube? Can you estimate? Well, that is a difficult question because uh, ECMO is not uh, frequently used in our center. We do about uh, two uh, in, in a year for uh, tracheal resections. Uh, each two years or three years, I think, one. So um, um, we have uh, succeeded to, um, to avoid one, but uh, I cannot tell that uh, in the future that it will be successful too. But I, I think uh, we will try it again, and uh, it must. Uh, I think that it will be successful. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Oh, that's uh, uh, from, from, from Digmar Eng. Um, he, li he likes the idea of the customized uh, tritube. Maybe Tegaderm uh, tape is the better option to reduce the cuff size. Ah. Well, um, <coughs> we, we experimented with uh, lots of things, even uh, some elastic uh, things. Um, but uh, yes, the best option is that uh, Ventinova makes a good one uh, for us. As said, we are uh, seriously investigating uh, this. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, I cannot make any promise on uh, on timelines uh, on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, um, the the series of cases uh, is that being published, uh, uh, Dr. Kut? Uh, well, I'm still writing on that, uh, but of course, we've got plans to get that published. Yes. Oh, that's and and it's we're still in the process. Oh, that's that's always good. That's always good. Um, <laughs> on average, uh, is uh, surgery time reduced using these uh, techniques? That is what the surgeons uh, tells us. Yes. Yeah. 
they, they uh, are on uh, uh, the time to uh, intubate uh, selectively in the left main bronchus, etc. Uh, that is not no more needed, and they can uh, go on working. There are no periods of apnea, and they sometimes they have to stop because we ask them because of the patients are uh, desaturating. So they can work on, work on with ongoing ventilation, and that um, yeah, that is one of their um, the, 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 one of the things that surgeons tells us. Yes, it's, it's fine to work with it, and that it go quickly. Out. Well, that's very good to know. Then I um, think we are uh, through all the questions. Um, and I would like to ask the uh, audience to fill out the poll that will uh, will appear in the screen mm -hmm. soon. That allows us to, to uh, enhance uh, this webinar. Um, and I would like to uh, thank you, Jo Marissa and uh, Marike Kuut, for this. I think it's a very uh, elegant uh, presentation, very excellent presentation. And uh, I learned a lot uh, from it. Um, and I see all the comments uh, of the audience. They also learned a lot, I think. Um, so uh, thank you very much for being present here. It was uh, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and everybody, thank you for watching, and we will be happy to uh, uh, see you in the next webinar.